Tonight's topic is faith, and the title, as you see there, is What's the Big Deal? In other words, what does this do for me? What does faith do for me? Why should I bother with this? What do I get out of this whole RCIA thing? A couple weeks ago, last week and two weeks ago, we talked about the only real reason to become Catholic is if it's true. If it's not true, that, that'd just be silly, you know. But... So it's not just about, like, how does it make you feel? It's about, is it true? But is there more? Does this truth do anything for you? So I would suggest that those are good and important questions. And there is a big challenge today. I, I actually talked about it quite a bit two weeks ago. There's a big challenge today when talking about religion and faith. And as a matter of fact, you know, the, the, what's the two things you never talk about, like in polite company or whatever? Uh, you know, at a religion, religion, and religion and politics. Oh, you guys are good. Okay. Religion and politics. And yet, in reality, those are two of the most important things. Because politics is how we govern ourselves down here on earth. And religion has to do with eternity. It has to do with now also, but eternity. Eternity is pretty important, you know. I often tell people when it comes to, like, moral things, religious things, it's not a matter of life or death. It's a matter of eternal life or eternal death. So, religion and politics. We'll talk more about religion. Don't worry. <laughs> so, yeah, politics, in reality, those are the only two things that are really worth talking about and what could be more important than these? Tonight, then, we want to look at a few things. Let's see here. Okay, that's a slide. I see, I'm not one of these tech guys, you know, so they make all these awesome slides, and then they had to teach me how to use it and stuff, so bear with me. We'll get through it somehow. So, uh, first, how is faith understood in the culture around us? We'll talk about that a little bit. What faith is not... We'll get into that. What faith is. The point of our CIA, becoming Catholic as we call it here. Then uh, we'll go through a biblical passage to help concretize these things we talk about. And we'll talk about the effect that faith is supposed to have on us. It's supposed to affect us. And then a preview for next week. We'll talk a little bit about is faith reasonable? And I'll mention, well, I'll mention that at the end as a preview. So, first and foremost, how is faith understood in the culture around us? Father John talked about an ESPN announcer who, who said, I guess that's what faith is, belief in the absence of evidence. So, I went around online today, Richard Dawkins says the same thing. The vast majority of atheists that I could find say the exact same thing. Even, even Mark Twain, who's pretty amazing in many ways, said that, you know, faith is believing when you know it ain't so. No, that's not good. That is not faith. Don't learn your religion from atheists. You should, that should be common sense, but it, it, common sense is not as common as it used to be, you know. So, so to believe in the absence of evidence, and that is definitely not faith. Definitely not faith. So faith is not just an opinion. Faith is not ignorant. Faith is not blind. A lot of people think faith is blind. It's not blind. It's actually the opposite of blind. We'll get more into that. Faith is not unreasonable. It definitely is not unreasonable. 
So what is faith? I'm going to start marching through some paragraphs in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So really, I'm, I'm going through paragraphs 142 through 184. We're not going to read all of those, but that's the section. 142 through 184. And luckily, it's not pages 142 through 184. When I, when I went to Ave Maria, we were assigned to read you know, the first 101 paragraphs of the catechism, and I almost died, like 101 pages, holy mackerel. But it's only like 20 pages, just 101 paragraphs. So these 42 paragraphs, I'm going to start highlighting them. We'll put them on the board. You can, you can follow them with your, okay, yeah, it's working. You can follow them with your catechism. So number 143, by faith, man completely submits his intellect and his will to God. With his whole being, man gives his assent to God, the revealer. Sacred scripture calls this human response to God, the author of revelation, the obedience of faith. The obedience of faith. But this means faith is a response. Again, by faith, man completely submits his intellect and his will to God. But what do you have to do what do you have to see? What do you have to encounter before you can give anything to God? You've got to encounter God first. So something has to happen prior to this. So we're going to back up, go from 143 to 142. By his revelation, the invisible God, from the fullness of his love, addresses men as his friends and moves among them in order to invite and receive them into his own company. The adequate response to this invitation is faith. So first and foremost, it's an invitation from God. It's, it's amazing and a little bit scary. In Matthew sixteen eighteen or thereabouts, maybe sixteen sixteen, when when uh, you know Peter says, "You are the Christ, Son of the Living God," and Jesus says, "Blessed are you, you know Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father." We have to rely on the heavenly Father for faith. That can be scary. It, it shouldn't be scary at all. I mean, he's God. I think he's much more reliable than any of us. And yet, that can intimidate us. Like, what if he doesn't give me the gift of faith? Okay. So, 150. Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 150. Faith is, first of all, a personal adherence of man to God. At the same time, and inseparably... It is free assent to the whole truth that God has revealed. As personal adherence to God and assent to his truth, Christian faith differs from our faith in any human person. It is right and just to entrust oneself wholly to God and to believe absolutely what he says. It would be futile and false to place such faith in a creature. Part of my own conversion, I shared this two weeks ago, but part of my own conversion was going to Ave Maria University and starting to pray and just meeting God and being like, wow, I can trust him. And then starting to make that act of faith. The act of faith is the, okay, Lord, now I trust in you. And it's amazing to go on a little tangent. So last week or two weeks ago when I talked, I asked Bob, how long should I talk? He's like, oh, 45 minutes, an hour. Talk as long as you want. And I'm like, man, I'm hoping I can talk for a whole 30 minutes. And then I was up here for a whole hour. So I'm going to try not to do that to you today. I'm, gonna, I'm shooting to talk between 45 minutes and an hour. Cross your fingers. Pray hard. We'll see what actually happens. But in any case, at Ave Maria University, where was I? I was going to, I was going to go on a tangent. What was I going to say? trust. Oh, yes. Okay. So I tell you what, I saw God work. I don't know if I told you this part of the story. You can stop me if I did. But I, I went on a pilgrimage to Rome, and you know, I, I'd quit my plumbing job. Um, I spent most of my money on that first year at Ave Maria. I had enough money to go back to college or to go on this pilgrimage to Rome, one or the other. What's that? 
<laughs> that went quickly at school. You know how much school costs nowadays? Holy mackerel. But in any case, yeah, too much. Um, so, uh, so I, you know, money to go back to college the next year or to go on this pilgrimage, one or the other. And I was at a very, you know, I'd been discerning. I was at a very, like, important time. And I was going to go with this religious order who'd been great for me. It's like, I need to do this. And I need to come back to Ave Maria. There's no way I can do both. So I outsmarted God. I, uh, I, I called up some, some people from my home parish, some wealthy people, and said, hey, you know, I'm looking to go on this pilgrimage. Can you sponsor me? And they're like, oh, we love what you're doing with your life. Um, we're going to pray about it. We'll get back to you. Great. Okay, I figured the check was in the mail. They emailed back a few days later. No, we're sorry. We don't think we should do this at this time. Okay. So, back to square one. So I was praying with the parable of the rich young man and how, you know, Jesus Christ said, give me everything, you know, give everything to the poor, come follow me. And at that time, Jesus was telling me, give everything away. You know, it's like $3,000, you know. Give that away, come follow me, just trust in me. And it was so hard to do. But the night I received the email, I went online with my credit card. I swiped the credit card, bought my plane tickets to Rome, and said, okay, Lord, it's up to you now. And I tell you what, money fell off the trees. Um, in the end, I asked two people for money. One said no, the Knights of Columbus said yes. And, and then a bunch of other people who I did not ask for money gave me money. And so most of the trip was paid for by the time I left Ave, except for the pilgrimage itself. The pilgrimage itself was 810 bucks. We slept on concrete floors and stuff. That's, you know, that's why it's 810 bucks. Um, it was 810 bucks, and I was walking out of the Ave Maria Oratory on my last day, about to hop into my car, and at, at, at the back, this man's like, how you doing for loot? I'm like, well, I could use $810 for a pilgrimage. And he goes, come on over to my house, I'll give you 810 bucks. So I went over to his house, and he said, here's $810, and here's another 20 because I like you. I have seen, <laughs> I don't know what the 810 was for, you know, 20 is because I like 810, well, you know, yeah. So, uh, I mean, like, I've seen God work in my life. There's, who would be more trustworthy than God? And yet, 10 years after the fact, here I am, an ordained priest, it's still hard to really put that faith in God. That's part of sin, part of fallen human nature. Okay, that's a tangent. Let's get back on schedule. So, what was up there? 150. Let's move on to 151. Hmm. Okay, there we go. For a Christian, believing in God cannot be separated from believing in the one he sent, his beloved Son, in whom the Father is well pleased. God tells us to listen to him. The Lord himself said to his disciples, Believe in God, believe also in me. We can believe in Jesus Christ because he is himself God, the Word made flesh. No one has ever seen God, the only Son, the, the only Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has made him known, because he has seen the Father. Jesus Christ is the only one who knows him and can reveal him. So, if you're going to put all this faith in God, the Father, Got to put all his faith in God, the Son, too, and God, the Holy Spirit. We'll get more into Trinitarian theology later. But for right now, quick little side note. It's interesting how, okay, for a Christian, believing in God cannot be separated from believing in the Son, his beloved Son, in whom the Father is well pleased. In the church, now bear with me on this one. In the church, we have it all. We do. Throughout, this might be beside the point, but throughout history, God started revealing himself in nature. You know, through reason, you can look at nature, there's got to be something, do some metaphysics, and okay, I believe in God. Don't know what God looks like, but I believe in God. In the Old Testament, he started revealing himself more and more in the prophets. Just one at a time, a little more about God, a little more about God, a little more about God. And then along comes Jesus Christ, the Word, who is God, who revealed himself, who gave us himself completely. So since he gave us himself completely, we completely have Jesus Christ. Now, what do we have 
oh, that's a big, that's, that's 2,000 years of theology and still developing. We don't always know what we have, but we have them. Okay, that's beside the point. I shouldn't have said that. So, 153, Catechism of the Catholic Church, 153. Faith is a gift of God, a supernatural virtue infused by him. Before this faith can be exercised, man must have the grace of God to move and assist him. He must have the interior helps of the Holy Spirit, who moves the heart and converts it to God, who opens the eyes of the mind and makes it easy for all to accept and believe the truth. And 154 follows very well. Believing is possible only by grace and the interior helps of the Holy Spirit. But it is no less true that believing is an authentically human act. Okay, we'll continue that quote in a second. But believing is possible only by grace. I mentioned this earlier. And it's interesting. Here's just a thought of mine. Take it or leave it. But you know, like like when you bring the faith out, and some people really have a hard time with it, and, and sometimes, sometimes you know, there might be sin in the way, there might be this in the way, there might be a closed mind, there could be any number of things, and sometimes I wonder if maybe God just hasn't given the pers- the person the grace yet. God will give the grace, but I often wonder that, and I could go into the theology of that and so on and so forth, but you'd all fall asleep. So, you're supposed to laugh at that, I'm sorry. Last, last year, I was a new priest, and I, I often like to start off a homily or talk with a joke. So I did. I, I chose a joke from Fulton Sheen, and I told the joke, and no one laughed. And I'm like, yeah, I didn't think it was funny either. You know, and then we moved on. It was, it was a cheesy joke. It was. I'm, I'm not going to. As much as I love Fulton Sheen, it was a cheesy joke. Okay. 155. Catechism of the Catholic Church. 155. All right. Okay. In faith, the human intellect... Oh, we didn't finish 154. I'm sorry. That was important. Okay, 154. Believing is possible only by grace and the interior helps of the Holy Spirit, but it is no less true that believing is an authentically human act. That's very important. Authentically human act. Trusting in God and cleaving to the truths he has revealed are contrary neither to human freedom nor to human reason. We'll get more into that later. Even in human relations, it is not contrary to our dignity to believe what other persons tell us about themselves and their intentions or to trust their promises. For example, when a man and a woman marry, to share a communion of life with one another. If this is so, still less is it contrary to our dignity to yield by faith the full submission of intellect and will to God who reveals and to share in an interior communion with him? So they use the example of trusting another human being, husband and wife, you know, um, putting faith in that person. I, I read this years ago, you know, someone said, yeah, so and so is my son. Well, I mean, that's what my wife tells me and I believe her. He's got faith in his wife. But how much more can we have faith in God who is not a sinner, who's perfect in every way? And this points to the fact that it's a human act. That's, that's important. And philosophers go nuts with this, but um, the fact that it's a human act shows that we have a capacity for God. God is supernatural, and yet we naturally have a desire and a capacity for the supernatural philosophers start bleeding from the brain when they hear that. But it's an amazing thing. We're made for God. That's the point. Okay, any questions so far? Comments? No? Good, okay. So, 155. In faith, the human intellect... What's that? In faith, the human intellect and will cooperate with divine grace. Believing is an act of the intellect, assenting to the divine truth by command of the will, moved by God through grace. Holy mackerel, that is a dense sentence. Anyone want to try to expand on that? What's that? No? Okay, let's see what time we got. 717. Okay, I don't want to 
dive too much into that. Um, believe is an act of the intellect assenting to divine truth by the command of the will, moved by God through grace. Again, moved by God through grace. There is something, when you, when, you, when you love something, I think I said this two weeks ago, but when you love something, you will desire that everyone else love that too. There's just a movement that happens when you meet someone, something that you love so much. And when you meet God, you can't help it. Just, it just overflows. That's the nature of love, and we get into the philosophy of that, but... We have places to go. So, 156. Let's move on to 156. What moves us to believe is not the fact that revealed truths appear as true and intelligible in the light of our natural reason. We believe because of the authority of God himself who reveals them, who can neither deceive nor be conceived. That right? Yeah, okay, there we go. So that the submission of our faith might nevertheless be in accordance with reason, God willed that external proofs of his revelation should be joined to the internal helps of the Holy Spirit. We're going to stop right there real quickly. So because of the authority of God himself, and this gets into... You know, there's not always external evidence that you want. There often is. There often is. But there's not always external evidence that you want, but it's trusting in God. Once you meet God, you go, wow, I can trust him. Okay. And then by the authority of God, it actually, this might say it later, but, but our knowledge by faith is actually more sure than our knowledge by reason because... God is more trustworthy than us. Simple as that. Our reason is our reason. We use it as well as we can. But God's more trustworthy than our reason. We'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So to continue. Thus the miracles of Christ and the saints' prophecies, the church's growth and, and holiness and her fruitfulness and stability are the most certain signs of divine revelation adapted to the intelligence of all. They are motives of credibility which show that, that the ascent of faith is by no means a blind impulse of the mind. Faith seeks understanding. It is intrinsic to faith that a believer desires to know better the one in whom he has put his faith and to understand better what he has revealed. A more penetrating knowledge will in turn call forth a greater faith, increasingly set afire by love. That's really a beautiful paragraph. There's a lot happening, very big paragraph. But the, faith, the fact that faith seeks understanding. It's, I mean, man, when you meet God and the one who loves you so much, you can't help it. Boy, I want to know about this guy. You know, I mean, like, have you ever found someone who's just really interesting? A few years ago, I went on an Evil Knievel kick. Has anyone here ever been on an Evil Knievel kick? Well, John, of course, but, you know, normal people don't do that. But, um, so it's just me and John. And he was on Johnny Carson one time, and Johnny Carson just, like, like he just kept him on, kept asking him questions. And, and I think he had two other interviews to get to he never got to. And Johnny Carson's like, this is just like the most fascinating person I ever met. Like, you are so interesting. Well, how much more interesting is God? So when you meet him, you just, you just want to know more about him. Then the more you know about him, it's just easier to put your faith into him. Then you put more faith into him and you want to know more about him. So it's, it's the opposite of a vicious cycle. What's, what's the opposite of a vicious cycle? I think there's a term for that. Anyone know it? No, I don't know it either, but, you know, it's the opposite of a vicious cycle. <laughs> No, because vicious cycle is going downward. An upward, upward movement. I don't know. Okay, so let's move on to 159. Hmm. My numbers on my paper are different than the numbers on the slides. Fun, fun. <laughs> the grace 
Okay, so 158, according to the slide here, the grace of faith opens the eyes of your hearts to a lively understanding of the, cont- of the contents of revelation, that is, of the totality of God's plan and the mysteries of faith, of their connection with each other and with Christ, the center of the revealed mystery. That's interesting. The the totality of God's plan and the mysteries of faith. We live in a very, very, very com- compartmentalized world, and that's because of sin. You know, um, yeah, the devil divides and God unites. So when there's division, it's always some consequence of sin. Somewhere there is sin happening. And uh, yeah, the faith, the Holy Spirit unites, so the faith should help you to see, like, the big picture of life. What's the point of life? So on, so forth. And we really have a hard time with that. Like, in universities, people, you know, you learn the subject, you learn the subject, you go make money, but oftentimes they don't back up and say, why? What's the whole point? And similarly, you know, there are many, many, I'll give you some examples without listing any kind of names, but I've, I've seen Catholics in the church, you know, priests. When you become a priest, like like you say the creed and you you uh, make a take an oath that you like you believe in what the church teaches. Um, to enter the church, you say something similar, but it's not as strong as an oath. As a priest, you say an oath that you believe in what the church teaches. I've seen priests who, and these are this is back in the day. Most of these guys are dead, but I've seen priests who are like, they're saintly when it comes to helping the poor, when it comes to doing penances. I mean saintly. And then with other things like absolute devil. That's compartmentalized. Like, God has certainly touched this part of, you know, the life. But over here, no God, I'll do my own thing here. So that's sin. Sin divides, sin compartmentalizes, and there's a lot of that going on in the world ever since the fall. So it's, it's been going on for a while. Any questions, comments? We're almost through the catechism quotes, so hang in there. You're doing well. So 159. Faith and science. Though faith is above reason, there can never be any real discrepancy between faith and reason. I mentioned this two weeks ago. If, if there's a discrepancy, something's wrong. Either reason's wrong or faith, there's, there's something wrong, you know. But So there's, no, there's never a real discrepancy. Since the same God who reveals mysteries and infuses faith has bestowed the light of reason on the human mind, God cannot deny himself, nor can truth ever contradict truth. Consequently, Methodological research in all branches of knowledge, provided it is carried out in a truly scientific manner and does not override moral laws, can never conflict with the faith, because the things of the world and the things of faith derive from the same God. The humble and persevering investigator of the secrets of nature is being led, as it were, by the hand of God in spite of himself. For it is God, the conserver of all things, who made them what they are. Again, this gets back to, okay, God made reason, God made faith, there's no contradiction. And we'll explain that in a little more depth a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, a little bit later. Any questions on that? Okay. Okay. So, Father John offered. <clears throat> there we go. All is better now. So, Father John offers his own little definition of faith, and it's, uh, I like it. It's I'll put it on the board here. Faith is God's work in me to which I respond. That's, uh, if you go to Catechism 166, it doesn't say that word for word, but it says that in bigger words, basically. Faith is God's work in me to which I respond. So the question is, do we respond? We know God's working, but do we respond? He died for us. He loves each and every one of us. He gives everyone the necessary grace to go to heaven and be with him for eternity and, and complete happiness but we're free to reject it. So do we respond? 
So, okay, moving on from the catechism here. Do we want to break, Bob? Do we want to break now? Not yet? Oh, when, when are we supposed to? I might be done in 15 minutes. Okay. Okay. I'm getting nervous now. I prepare enough stuff. I'm, I'm still new at this, so bear with me. So, uh, okay. Faith is a way of knowing that does not contradict reason in any way, shape, or form. Um, this is huge. And I, I brought in, I was reading Fulton Sheen, believe it or not. And I just, like, I mean, I was just doing my usual spiritual reading. And I think it was like Monday, I got into the section about faith. And I'm like, hey, that's RCA on Thursday. So take a listen to this. Faith, this new light is to our reason what a telescope is to the eye. The telescope does not destroy the eye, nor does it create new worlds. But it it enables the eye to see realities that, although they were there before, the naked eye could never reach. To a person who does not believe in telescopes, it would seem that the astronomer is, is merely imagining the things he says he sees, that in describing distant stars and planets, he is the victim of a superstition. It is not uncommon for those who lack the gift of faith to, re- to attribute all belief in the supernatural world to imagination or to fantasy. That's a very good example of faith. Faith, you know, it gives light to the eyes. In a sense, it's still the same eyes. You're still looking at the same thing, but you're going to see it differently. But it's going to be the same thing. You're going to see it in, in a more profound way. I had, a, boy, I had a joke in mind from the Beverly Hillbillies. I can't think of it now. Well, if I think of it, I'll come back to it. Okay. So faith, faith is a light, as Fulton Sheen said. It's often heard or said that faith is blind. No, not at all. Exactly the opposite. To not believe, to not have faith is to be blind. So really, I mean, what the, what the atheists say about, oh, faith means believing when there's no evidence, we're against that. Like, we're on your side. We're against believing when there's absolutely no evidence. That's, that's, that doesn't work, you know. But our definition of faith is much different. Faith enables one to see. It illumines the intellect, not magically, but by the power of God's grace. Without faith, I cannot understand who God is. And without knowing who God is, I cannot understand who I am. For I am made in the image and likeness of God. Thus, only to the degree that I know him can I know myself. Otherwise, I will remain a riddle to myself. In the very first few chapters of Genesis, and I might have said this two weeks ago, but like we're made in the image and likeness of God. To know ourselves, we, ha- we have to get to know God. Yeah, that's about it. I don't know how to expand on that. I just, you know. Okay, so, and it changes your life. You know, just knowing through faith, having faith, having faith in God, meeting God, trusting in God will change your life. And this is crucial. Faith isn't an add-on. That's very important. Faith is not an add-on. A lot of people, if you can, you know, put a little football image in your mind, a lot of people think reason is running the ball down, you know, 20, 30, 40, running down the yard line. And then there's like, you know, some huge defensive end there. So they just lateral it to faith and faith takes it the rest of the way. No, it's not how it works. Faith permeates Everything, everything. Faith and reason work together at all times. Okay, so it's not an add-on, it's everything. How so? Because faith tells me that I matter so much that I am worth dying for and worth so much not just to anybody but to the one who created everything. I wrote a book. So I was in Rome for five years, you know, and I traveled a lot. Um, because there's nothing else to do, you know. It's just you can stare at the wall in your room. You go out and travel. I mean, there's plenty to do, but we traveled. Um, so, uh, so after years of traveling, I wrote a whole book, and it's, it's a travel guide. It's more of a how-to than a where-to. And when you put yourself out, like here's my thoughts, guys. They can get laughed at. It's why people are so embarrassed to public speak, why people are embarrassed to sing in public. There's something inside of you that, that gets out, you know, and people can accept it or reject it, and it could hurt. So I wrote this book, and I was hoping to distribute 
fifty copies. You know, it was, it was just it was just written for like the seminarians in house, and there's only two hundred and fifty of them. So if I distribute fifty copies, one out of five, feel, oh, I think that'd be good. So far, there's been about four hundred and fifty printed, um, and I thank you. And those first few days when people were really buying the book, man, I was walking taller. I felt good about myself. I, I mean, I noticed that. I, yeah, definitely. So, similarly, I went to Ave Marie University, in case I haven't mentioned that before. And Tom Monahan, of course, founded Ave Marie. He, he founded Domino's Pizza. He was worth about $3 billion back in the day. And he sold Domino's for a billion in 98, used that money to start Ave Maria. It was him... Uh, Collier County, which is very wealthy, and Pulte Homes, who kind of conglomerated for the financial aspects, blah, blah, blah. So there is, depending on what you read, about a billion dollars put in to Ave Maria University. And, and that's you know, where I went. That's where I discovered Jesus Christ. That's where I discovered my vocation. And uh, I think it was last year, two years. It was last year. Last year, I had a speaking engagement, uh, Ave Maria fundraiser. Tom Monahan was there. And it's like, you know what? I've never thanked him. So I thanked him. Thank you, Mr. Monahan. And he said, if it saves one soul, it's worth every penny. I said, wow, my soul's worth a billion dollars. <laughs> I was feeling really good about myself. But let me tell you, my soul is worth much more than a billion dollars. It's worth the blood of Jesus Christ, who loves us so much, who died for us. And with faith, when you meet the God who died for you, it just changes everything. That's, that's all I'm really trying to say. Okay. So, faith, and here's another point. Faith is not a factoid. It's not just, oh, I just intellectualize my faith. It's not mere information. It's not information, it's transformation. It's changing life. It is a response to an event, an actual historical event of God becoming man and laying down his life. And Father John says, not for y'all, but for you, but for you, but for you. If you, if I were the only one who had ever sinned in the history of the world, Jesus Christ would have came and died for us. That's the God we're asking you to embrace. So yeah, it's not just intellectualism. Fulton Sheen has a story he tells it in his autobiography. He, uh, he found out there was a leper in New York City. So he went and he found the leper. He, he tracked him down, and uh, he, he took him in. He was living with Fulton Sheen. Fulton Sheen was paying for all sorts of medical bills and whatnot, and Fulton Sheen catechized him and brought him into the faith. And, uh, and you know, so this was happening for a while, and then... This, uh, a woman came in and said, hey, I would, I'd love you to intellectualize your faith for me. I'd love you to see, I'd, yeah, I'd delve into the intellectualism of Catholicism. And Fulton Sheen, I guess, I guess he knew she wasn't you know, all that serious about really transformation. So, so uh, he said, oh, I'd, I, yeah, I'd, I'd catechize anyone. As a matter of fact, last week there was a leper sitting in the very chair that you're sitting in. <laughs> she got up and ran. So yeah, it's not just about intellectualizing. It's about transformation. And this is the point of RCIA. We're not interested in just tidbits and factoids. We're interested in changing lives. That's what Christianity is about. God wants to give you life. He wants to give you freedom. He wants you to get it. That is, to understand what this life is really about. Why we are here where we are going, and how to get there. Faith, knowing why we are here, where we are going, how to get there, and that God wants us to be happy, not only in heaven, but now on earth. This coming up Sunday, uh, we have the readings for the workers in the vineyard. And I could talk forever about this, so I'll be careful. But um, the workers in the vineyard. And I'm not going to preach on this part, because that's just how the Holy Spirit works. Um, but it is interesting how, how the, uh, you know, the, the workers who came first thing, when everyone got their pay, everyone received the same amount of pay, even if they started working at 9 in the morning or 5 at night, they all got the same pay. And, of course, it's a parable for the kingdom of heaven where if you, you know, live a good, virtuous life from when you were born, and if you, you know, convert on your deathbed, you still get heaven. And the people who, who, you know, worked early, they were jealous, like, what's going on? You should have given me more. 
And that's a very, very bad, bad misunderstanding of heaven and God. To, to be jealous of someone who, you know, converted on his deathbed is to want to live their life. You know, oh, I wish I was living the life of sin. Ooh, that's not good. You know, find me a saint somewhere who said, you know what, I wish I converted later in life. Good luck, good luck. And also, actually, to go into Pope Francis's Evangelii Gaudium, which is the joy of the gospel, he talks about, like, long-faced Christians, people who live the Christian life but begrudgingly, okay, fine. You know, like, I'll, I'll go through the tortures, I'll jump through the hoops, and then get heaven afterward. And that's a very, very sad misunderstanding of who God is. Like, God loves you, you know, it, it, he's, he's not some evil God who likes to poke at you and make you jump through hoops and then, okay, fine, you're, you were a good, a good toy, you can get heaven in the end. No, no, that's not how it works. It all goes together. Part of faith is seeing the whole. And when you see the whole, you realize heaven is not just later. It starts right now on earth. So those workers in the vineyard, you know, like basically the parable is saying um, they're all paid a day's wage. Now, if any of you have been without work, that's not the most fun thing as you await to have a job, to not have a job. You don't know what the day is bringing on. Whereas when you're working, okay, I got a job. You know, the, so, so the, uh, the, the workers who are there all day, that's like those who, who live a life for God their entire lives. And that in itself is part of the reward because heaven starts right here on earth. I had to get that out because that's what I originally wanted to preach about, and then it just didn't, didn't come, so I preached to you about it. I feel better now. Okay. So, let's get back to this here. We're going to go through a Bible passage. So, if you could break open your Bibles. Oh, we're going to put it on the screen, too, but, you know. Break open your Bibles to Acts the Acts of the Apostles. I once heard a, a little kid say, yeah, and then they killed him with the Acts of the Apostles. Okay, it's a little bit different than that. The New Testament, which is the end of the book, the first four books are the Gospels, the fifth book is the Acts of the Apostles. And we're going to chapter 3, so it's very close to the beginning. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And I'm going to read it in the original Greek. No, I'm joking. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Yep. You're very welcome. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of those who entered the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him with John and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention upon them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And he took him by the hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. A little side note. You know, like, you'll see these biblical commentaries that'll, like, explain away all the gospel, all the miracles. I, I once heard, I haven't found this, but I once heard that Thomas Jefferson rewrote the gospels and took all the miracles out of them because he didn't believe in them. Um... Or, some, you know, there are people who say, oh, well, you know, Jesus convinced him he was well, so he got up and walked away. I was in a cast one day for 10 days, just 10 days, on my ankle. I sprained my ankle five years ago. And when the doctor took it off, I could barely walk. I actually, you know, I wanted to fool the doctor that I was good enough to go on my own. So I'm like, okay, when I get off the bed, if I get off on his side, 
you know, he's going to see me right away. If I get off on this side, I'll be able to get two steps of practice in before he can see me. So I got off on the other side, and I walked the best I could, but it was an absolute pain. I could barely walk. So, yeah, when, you know, someone gets up and is leaping and jumping and praising God, yeah, that's a miracle. But in any case, so the lame man is sitting there at the so-called beautiful gate of the temple begging. He is asking for money to pay for his living expenses, which he himself is not able to earn. He's asking for money as a substitute for something else. A substitute for something else. He's asking for money as a substitute for his freedom, which he does not have. As a substitute for his own life, which is denied him. It's interesting. I was, I was in Rome for five years, and there are zillions of beggars in Rome. And it's, it's really tough to work with them. It's, it's, it's just, it's, it's really tough. No matter what you do, you feel like you did the wrong thing, you know. And they tell us, do not give money. They make plenty of money. Um, so, so my philosophy was always, if someone comes up and asks for help, they need help, you know. They don't necessarily need money, but they need help. So to give them a warm smile, give them the love of Christ, is often much more help than money, which is what they usually want. Um, okay, yeah. So, so, yeah, this guy, you know, he's asking for money as a substitute to his freedom. Uh, and now Peter and John come along. And how poor, how poor they are with regard to what the man is asking for. They, he wants money. So Peter says, I have no silver or gold. But how rich they are with regard to what the man actually needs. What he's, what he's not thinking about, what he dares not to ask for. And yet is the essential thing. So Peter says, I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. The unasked for, the unexpected, unrequested thing is given instead of the substitute. The essential thing is given to him his own life. He, in a sense, is given to himself. From now on, he can stand on his own two feet, can walk his own path, can leap which is a sign of freedom. Man hungers not only for bread and money, but for more. We have something to give for which man does not ask and about which he often does not know that he wants, that that's his real need. There was a saint, I forget what saint it was, who said that even the man knocking on the brothel door is seeking God. Everyone seeks God. They might not know they seek God, but everyone seeking God, that gets back to our capacity for God, our longing for God. Okay, yeah. Man hungers for bread and money, but for more. We have something to give for which man does not ask and about which he often does not know, and that yet is his real need. We have the name of Jesus Christ. What I said earlier, we have Jesus Christ to give. You can never just hang on to him. You have to give him. And this name of Jesus Christ is the thing for which man hungers and asks in all its protests against inadequacies in the world, even if he does not know it. It is the gift that can give man back his freedom. It's kind of like Braveheart at the end, you know, freedom! Yeah, yeah, I tell you what, like you talk to someone who was in addiction and got out of the addiction and what they'll say about freedom. You know, they never even, they, they, at the time, they didn't even know they didn't have it. But then when they have it, it's like, wow, I've been set free. I've become myself, whom God always wanted me to be, a happy, holy, and healthy person. So this is precisely what it means to give the name of Jesus, to give Jesus himself and to say, you are free. Your guilt does not matter anymore. The burden of your past has been taken from you. You can stand up and go your way and can go to God and can leap and sing praise. So this is what we are about here at RCIA. This is what we're about here at Becoming Catholic, which is the same thing. You know. Silver and gold we have not, but we do have, we give you. We give you Jesus. And to know Jesus, to respond in faith to what he has done is to become alive, to be free, to know life, to find the way to happiness which everyone is longing for. 
when I, uh, boy, you know, I, I get these stories to tell, and then I forget, like, did I say this last time or not? So you can just stop me if I did. But uh, two weeks ago, I don't know if I said this or not, but four years ago, I worked for the Missionaries of Charity in Calcutta. I was there for six weeks. I was in Calcutta for four weeks, and then around India, another week and a half. And it's interesting, Mother Teresa often used to um, challenge her sisters. She just, she'd say, like, what makes us different than communists? Like, we ladle soup, communists ladle soup. What's the difference? And she always said that the difference is when we ladle soup, we, la- we ladle soup with the love of Jesus Christ. We give people Jesus Christ. When we lose that love, we're just like communists, only they're probably better at ladling soup. It's the love of Christ, the love of Christ. Okay, so what's supposed to be this effect of faith? Again, faith in our modern culture is seen, you know, as just ridiculous. Uh, you know, a hat that someone puts on, just, you know, throwing the ball, lateral in the ball, letting faith take over. It's seen as accidental. It might be cool, but at the end of the day, no big deal. And that's why Father John called this talk, What's the big deal? The big deal is faith. But faith is more like leaven. Leaven in the bread. It goes through the whole bread and it makes it rise. Fulton Sheen, uh, he uses the example that that uh, we're, we're like a bunch of drunkards. Like really, when, when you know, a drunkard has his senses but doesn't use them well. When we fell, when we get into sin, when we don't have faith, we have reason, but it's not going to work as well. Faith penetrates everything. It's like yeast makes everything rise, makes the reason work much, much better. Okay, what else do we have? Okay, lovely. So is faith reasonable? This is the most important question of our age. Is faith reasonable? We live in a culture where the air we breathe more or less tells us that faith is not Reasonable Faith is incomp- incompatible with reason. We hear this over and over again in countless ways. You know, the church opposes science and all this stuff. Or that faith is ignorant, so on and so forth. And this is not so. And we will make the claim in the weeks ahead. We'll get to this. I'm leaving. This is the trailer, you know, a little teaser. Um, we'll get to this more later. We'll dive more deeper into the person of Jesus Christ, what he has said and what he has done, and how we know that's true. But the initial question, then, if we're going to get into Jesus Christ, is, okay, what about this Jesus Christ? And what about what we read about Jesus Christ? That's a big question. Big question. We discover him in the New Testament. We discover him especially in the Gospels. Are they really reliable? Is it a trustworthy document? It was written a long time ago. Things were written different back then. How do we understand it? Did it ever actually happen? These are good questions. Because of the importance of the topic, it'll be next week.